Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So in the last lecture, we were discussing, we have started the revision of salary. And in that lecture, we have discussed about allowances, how allowances are taxable. In the second part, we have discussed about the deductions from gross salary. Deductions are covered under section 16. And if the assessee is following default tax regime, that is new tax regime, if the assessee is following, then he is eligible, he or she is eligible only for standard deduction, not any other deduction, only standard deduction is available in case of new regime. That is gross salary of 50,000, whichever is lower. Whereas if the assessee is following optional scheme, in that case, all deductions, all three deductions can be allowed. One is standard deduction. Treatment is same in both the regimes. But second is, which is allowed only in optional is entertainment allows, available only to central government and state government employee. And the third one is tax on employment or we can say professional tax. So these three deductions are only in optional scheme and in default regime, we have only standard deductions, right? Now we have to understand our uh, next part that is perquisites. Perquisites is covered under section 17.2, right? 17.2 is perquisites. Okay, we know that there are three sections in salary, 15, 16 and 17, right? Section 15 is the charging section of salary, which says that if the uh, relationship between the payer and the receiver is of master and servant, employer and employee, then that income will be taxed under the head salary, right? That was section 15. Section 16 deals with deductions, which we have already discussed, deductions from gross salary, right? Standard deduction, entertainment allowance or tax on employment and in new regime, in default scheme, only standard deduction is allowed. Section 17 has three subsections. We have 17.1, 17.2 and 17.3. Out of it, 17.2 is most important. 17.1 is simply definition of salary. What all components are there in salary, that is definition of salary. No need to remember that. In fact, you don't have to uh, mug up these sections number. You don't need to uh, learn these section number. But still, if you should have a fair, if you have a fair idea of these sections, and if you write these sections in your examinations, it gives a good impression on examiner, right? But 17.2, try to learn a bit, 17.2. 17.1 is meaning of salary. 17.2 covers different types of perquisites are there. There are different clauses. Don't go in that part. No need to remember those clauses. But if you have fair idea that perquisites are covered under 17.2, that would be good enough. 17.3 is profit in lieu of salary. We will be discussing that also, right? So now we let's jump on uh, section 17.2. 17.2 deals with perquisites. And we understand that generally these perquisites are non-monetary. These perquisites which you receive are in kind. Let's say rent-free accommodation or concessional rent accommodation. So employer provides employee with these accommodation. That is in kind. That is non-monetary. Or I can give you various examples like motor car facility or domestic servant facility. So if employer provides uh, with motor car or they provide with a domestic servant or any other kind of perquisites, so generally these are non-monetary. We say that these are in kind, these are non-monetary. Now the question arises whether these perquisites can be monetary also. The answer is yes. These perquisites can be monetary also. Let's say if you get a reimbursement of such perquisites from your employer, then they turns to be a monetary perquisite. For example, let's say domestic servant facility. Let's say employee engages a, girl, a domestic servant by himself or herself. Employee engages a domestic servant and employee also pays salary to that servant. And later on, what he does is he gets this salary reimbursed from employer. Right? He is getting the salary reimbursed from employer. So employer pays him cash, whatever the salary which he has paid to the domestic servant, employer is reimbursing that salary. So that is called monetary perquisite. Right? So generally, the perquisites are non-monetary, but yes, sometimes it could be monetary also. Correct? So perquisites may be in cash or in kind. And this is also, we understand, this is quite logical that let's say employee has spent something that is for official purpose, that is entirely for official purpose. Let's say, for example, his office is based in Chennai and he went to Madurai for some official purpose, for not for personal, but official purpose. His employer sends him to Madurai, from Chennai to Madurai. 
so there will be some expenses which uh, which would be incurred or let's say employee incurred first these expenses are incurred by employee and later on he gets this reimbursement from employer so please tell me when these expenses are getting reimbursed is this for the benefit of the employee the answer is no simply no this is not for the benefit of the employee this is for the benefit of the employer right so if you get any reimbursement because you have spent something for official duties and once you get this reimbursement that will not become your income why you will be going to pay tax on this because this is not your income this is something which you have spent for official purpose so any reimbursement which you get for your official purpose is not your perquisite right and we also understand that the perquisites which are provided in the course of employment perquisites which are provided in the course of employment are taxed under the head salary why i have uh, inserted this point over here because we understand that in pgvp when you are running your business or when you are running your profession you might receive some perquisites from your clients from your customers from your supplier so in that case the perquisites are received from customers clients or suppliers in the course of business or profession that is taxable under the head pgvp not under the head salary so please you don't have to think that whenever you will uh, see this word perquisite it will always go in salary no please understand this perquisite should come from employer if it is coming from employer then it will be taxed under the head salary if it is coming from someone else like customers clients etc then it if it is in the course of business or profession then pgvp income that we will learn in pgvp part also okay and other thing we should know that there are different kinds of perquisites uh, for mainly these perquisites are fully taxable these perquisites are fully taxable we have to determine the value of those perquisites so what we will do is we will see different types of perquisites and then we will understand how to determine the value of these perquisites so these perquisites are mainly fully taxable the valuation which we have arrived that should be fully taxable but we also understand there are few perquisites which are tax free which are exempt we don't have to pay tax on that so what are those perquisites we will see that part also and there are th the third category is that there are certain perquisites which are taxable only in the case of specified employee so there are uh, there is a term uh, specified employee also in salary you must be remembering that uh, if employee satisfied one of those condition which we will see that if he is a director of the company or he has a substantial interest in the concern or in case uh, his monetary income is more than 50000 rupees that we will discuss right so if the person becomes specified employee then only there are few perquisites there are five perquisites which will be taxable in only in the hands of specified employee and if the person is not a specified employee it is not covered under that particular conditions that person is not a specified employee in that case those perquisites would be exempt like five perquisites are there motor car facility your uh, domestic uh, bills etc domestic servant etc education facility and free tickets to uh, the employee who works in transportation that we i'll be covering today right so there are different types of perquisites one uh, type of perquisite are fully taxable for all employees uh, there are certain perquisites which are tax free and there are also certain perquisites which are taxable only in the case of specified employee you should understand that right you know and that we have to cover all these points so right now we have we have already discussed allowances and everything but now we are on this part we have to discuss perquisites today and if time will permit we will start with retirement benefit otherwise uh, i'll cover the retirement benefit in the last part of uh, salary right it might be the third lecture of salary also because uh, there is an amendment here in rfa i have to discuss that amendment in length i'll be discussing that in detail so i'll be uh, taking some time here because that amendment was not there in your study material even uh, if you have received new study material for may 2024 examinations that is not there it has uh, been inserted in the statutory update which has recently been released from icai so you should because that is also applicable for our examinations of 2024 may and november both and onwards so that uh, amendment is there in statutory update that i'll be covering and i'll be discussing that in detail so i might take some uh, more time here and whatever you understand whatever is the amendment that becomes very important for our examinations as well okay so let me start with rfa first rent free accommodation and similarly we'll cover concessional rent accommodation also see okay 
So rent free accommodation section 17.2. You don't need to remember this one clause. 17.2 is more than enough. So rent free accommodation is covered under 17.2. We understand that if the employee is a central government or a state government employee, is a government employee, then in that case, the value of perquisite, we don't have to uh, bother about that. We have to. Uh, we don't have to uh, be uh, take tension in that because that would be easily available in your question. Whatever is the license fees, that becomes the perquisite. So whatever is the license fees, that becomes the perquisite. Uh, let me explain this in uh, this to you in detail. So we are talking about rent free accommodation right now, and then later on uh, I will cover concessional rent accommodation as well. Okay. rent free accommodation we understand first of all we see that the person who is getting this perquisite is a government employee or that person is a non government employee so if the employee is a government employee we understand that value of perquisite of RFA, value of perquisite is very easy because this is license fees. And how we will be determining this license fees, we don't have to worry about it because that will be given in your question, right? That will be given in, that will be mentioned in the question itself. So this is very easy to calculate because the license fees, whatever is the license fees, we will say that this is the value of the perquisite. So this part is very easy. Second part is also easy, but yes, you have to calculate something. Second part says for non-government employee, if the employee is a non-government employee. We understand that it has two parts. So the accommodation which has been provided to this non-government employee. First of all, we have to see whether it is this accommodation which has been provided, whether this accommodation is owned by the employer or hired by the employer, right? So we also understand, first we make it, uh, we just split this into two parts, whether this accommodation is owned by the employer, owned by the employer, or the employer has taken this accommodation on rent and then they have provided this accommodation to us. So second part is accommodation hired by employer. Hired means they have taken on rent, hired by employer, right? You must have done in this manner. So if the accommodation is owned by the employer, how we will be determining the perquisite? We determine that is based on the population of that city where this accommodation is provided. So we understand we take 2001 census to determine whatever, what is the population of the, that particular city. So there is a change in that. Now this change has been updated in the in your statutory update, which has recently been released by our institute. So now it is, first of all, you have to take the population as per the census of 2011. Earlier it was in your book also, in your study material also, it is given 2001. But now it has been changed for our examination as per the statutory update. So first, Amendment is that you have to take the census that is the population count as per 2011 and we understand every 10 years there is a population count so after 2001 it was in 2011 so we have to take census as per 2011 now first thing first change second change is that if the population of that city is up to 15 lakh second change Earlier it was 10. Now I'll not discuss about that earlier one because now you have to remember this new one. So if the population is up to 15 lakh, then the value of perquisite should be earlier it was 7.5 something. Now it is 5%, just 5%. So the perquisite value would be 5% of salary, 5% of salary, or I just give this word a name RFA salary. Uh, salary here includes basic salary, DA forming part, plus all taxable allowances, plus bonus, plus commission, everything except perquisites that we'll see also. But yes, I give this salary a name as RFA salary. So uh, if the population is up to 15 lakh, earlier it was 10 or something, but now it is 15. So if it is up to 15 lakh, the value of perquisite would be 5% of RFA salary. If the population is more than 15, 
मोर देन फिफ्टीन लाख बट अप टू फोर्टी लाख द वैल्यू ऑफ परक्यूजेट विल बी सेवन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ आर एफ ए सैलरी और सेवन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ सैलरी वट एवर यू कैन से एंड इफ इनकेज द पॉपुलेशन इज मोर देन फोर्टी लाख फर्स्ट सेकेंड थर्ड मोर देन फोर्टी लाख इट वुड बी टेन परसेंट ऑफ सैलरी अर्लियर इट वॉज फिफ्टीन नाउ इट इज टेन आर एफ ए सैलरी राइट so this is the second change first change is that you have to take the census as per 2011 population count and the population of the city where this accommodation is provided this accommodation is owned by the employer if the population is up to 15 5% if it is 15 to 40 more than 15 to 40 then it is 7.5 and more than 40 lakh it would be 10% right everything remains uh, almost the same just the percentage and the numbers are changed right second thing is that If the accommodation is hired by the employer, then the value of perquisite would be value of perquisite will be actual hire charges, actual hire charges, or we can say actual rental charges, which is paid by the employer. Or earlier it was fifteen, now it is ten percent of RFA salary, or ten percent of salary. Right? Why I am using this word RFA salary? I have just given this salary a name RFA salary. So ten percent of RFA salary, whichever is lower, whichever is lower. So this is the change, right? There are some minor other changes also, but this is the first change. Got it? So this percentages has been changed. Earlier it was fifteen, now it is just ten. Maximum it is ten percent of salary. so this is what you have to remember and if yes if furniture is also provided if this accommodation is furnished then you have to add that furniture perquisite value also how we calculate that that is very easy if that furniture is owned by the employer then we take 10% per annum of original cost original cost means actual cost not written down value actual cost so if it is owned by the employer and if they have provided let's say if they have provided for one year then take entire 10% per annum If they have provided for let's say eight months or nine months, please uh, make it accordingly eight by twelve or nine by twelve, ten percent into eight by twelve, nine by twelve. How much, whatever the time they have been, it has been provided to you. Please take that proportionately, right? And if that furniture is hired by the employer, then we take actual hire charges and we add that value in the value of perquisite, or you can write it separately also. That is uh, on you. That is on you completely. That furniture per unit value, either you either you can uh, add this in these values or you can uh, do it separately. So whether it is government, if government accommodation is provided, so these per units are all unfurnished. These are all unfurnished. And if furniture is also provided, please add that per unit value also. Actual higher charges or ten percent per annum of actual cost, as the case may be, you will add that value over here, that value over here, or that value over here, as the case may be. In government also, in government. If the employee is government employee, license fees is just for unfurnished. Please add that furniture value also. That is common and same in all the three cases. Got it? So this is mentioned in your book also. Okay. Ah, uh, so this is the amendment. If someone has downloaded this book earlier, and if this amendment is not covered, please I would suggest that please download it once again. Now I have covered this amendment. I have made that changes also in the book. So if this Value of RFA, uh, if it is owned by the employer, it would be five percent, seven point five percent, or ten percent of salary. Depends on population. You understand, five percent is up to fifteen lakh, seven point five percent is fifteen to forty. More than forty is ten percent, right? Plus furniture, furniture you can add. And here, if the house is taken on rent by the employer, actual rental charges or ten percent of RFA salary, whichever is lower. So amendment is here also. Earlier it was fifteen, now it is ten percent. Getting it? Okay. notes we understand now we have to take population as per 2011 census not as per 2001 as per 2011 census correct okay furniture is also provided owned by the employer 10% of original cost hired by the employer actual higher charges and this is same if the accommodation is provided in hotel if the accommodation is provided in hotel to a uh, Whomsoever, let it be a government employee or a non-government employee. For everyone, if the accommodation is provided in hotel, then it is same as before. Actual hotel charges or twenty-four percent of 
your salary 24 percent of rfa salary it is same there is no amendment over here right and we also understand you remember that that if the accommodation is provided for not more than 15 days if the employee is transferred to some other city an employer in that case provides them accommodation for the time being for not more than 15 days up to 15 days not more than that then it would it is a exempt perquisite it is a tax free perquisite right you should remember that also but if the accommodation is provided for more than 15 days then it becomes fully taxable i am saying fully taxable for example if the accommodation is provided for 16 days right that is more than 15 16 days then the entire 16 days will be taxable that is fully taxable not in excess of 15 only one day will not be taxable no the entire 16 days will be taxable getting it okay there is one more interesting amendment which is there in uh, rfa actually there is some concept of uh, cost inflation index which we uh, covers in capital gain chapter that cii concept has been introduced in this rfa perquisite also how oh. okay i'll discuss this in detail first of all uh, do you remember uh, cii that is cost inflation index when we use cii Sir, while calculating capital gain and if it is a long term capital gain, we used to index our cost of acquisition or cost of improvement. We have to index if it is short term, then CI was not required. But if it is long term, so we have to index also. Right. Uh, do you remember that this year's CI, although you don't have to learn this, this will be mentioned in your question, but still you should know this year's CI. So for previous year. 2324 we we know that the ci for this year is how much it is 348 right okay although we don't have to learn this but still we should know we should have an idea of this okay and uh, let's say if in any year if in any year uh for example let me take it here Let's say cost of acquisition of an asset, let's say of land or building or anything, any asset, any capital asset. Let the cost of acquisition of any capital asset, let's say it is 1 lakh. And this is first year. And let's say the CI of this year was, I'm taking it very randomly, right? I'm taking it very randomly. So let's say the CI for this year is 200. It was 200 of, of this year. And now we are transferring this capital asset let's say we are selling this capital asset after three four five years we are selling it let's say we are selling this after four years right let's say in fourth year so we are selling it for any amount that i'm not concerned i'm only concerned with indexation so let me give you the cia for this fourth year i'm taking it very randomly guys let me take it 280 right it is 280 so uh tell me how much is the index cost of acquisition tell me how much is the index cost of acquisition index cost of acquisition you know how to do this sir yes sir this is quite easy how to calculate index cost of acquisition in the numerator we take cii of the year of transfer that is 280 divided by CI of the year of acquisition that is 200 that is 280 upon 200 into cost of acquisition that was 1 lakh and this is the way we will um, determine the index cost of acquisition right so what you will do is you will say the index cost of acquisition is CI of the year of transfer is 280 yeah that means this year CI 280 divided by CI of the year of acquisition 200 into cost of acquisition 1 lakh this is how you do all these things how much it will be 280 divided by 200 into 1 lakh so this is be this is this would be rupees 1 lakh 40000 getting it this is the index cost of acquisition so what formula have you used you have used in the numerator first you have in this fraction in the numerator you have kept cii of the year of transfer this is index C, how you are doing this indexed cost of acquisition CII in numerator you are keeping CII of the year of 
transfer upon CII of the year in which it is first held by the SSE or I can use in the year of acquisition. Simply I'm using in the year of acquisition. CII of the year of acquisition into cost of acquisition, right? This is how you calculate. Okay. So if I have given you that uh, for first year, the cost of acquisition is 1 lakh, CI is 200 and how you will calculate the index cost of acquisition, you need this year CI and you will be able to calculate the index cost of acquisition. Okay. In the same manner, if I tell you that please calculate the indexed value of how much, let's say I'm giving you another example. This is another example. See, I can straight away tell you the formula also, but that is, um, that should not be the way. I should also tell you the logic, why this uh, amendment is here and how this, uh, they are using this formula. You should know about that also, right? So that is the reason I am just explaining this in detail. Okay. So let's say first year, the value is rupees 90,000. Let's say the value is 90,000 rupees. And CI is, let's say, uh, 300. This, this is a very random figure which I have taken. CI is 300. Okay. And this is now, let's say, fifth year. And the CI for this fifth year, I'm taking a very random figure. Let's say it is uh, 390. Tell me how much is the indexed value of this. Tell me the index value. I can write it cost of acquisition also, but here I have used the word just value, right? So there is no, nothing has changed so uh, that much. You have to calculate the indexed value of this. So easily we can calculate, we know that for if we have to calculate the value for this index value for this fifth year. So how we will calculate this indexed value would be 390 CI of this year divided by CI of that year, which we are taking it, that is first year, it is 300 into the cost of acquisition. Here I have just used the word value. So that is nothing but 90,000 rupees. Okay. And you can easily calculate 390 divided by 300 into 90,000. So that I'm getting rupees 1 lakh 17,000. Got it? So what is this 1,17,000? Sir, this is indexed value. This is the index value after fifth year. In fifth year, this is the index value. First year, it was 90,000. But now due to the cost inflation index, because earlier it was 300, now it is 390. So in the same proportion, we have increased this value. So the indexed value of this 90,000 in fifth year, it is 1,17,000. The same concept has been introduced here in salary. So let's say I give you Let's say in the first year, I'm giving you one more example. The RFA value. Now, initially I have taken cost of acquisition. In the second example, I have given you the name value. Now I'm taking RFA value. So RFA value, let's say it is 85,000. And CII for this year, let's say of this first year, let me take it very randomly 348. So this is this year's year, I'm taking it, I've taken it randomly, right? This is 348. And let's say in the second year, so this would be a short term capital gain. Why we are cal calculating in the second year itself? No, I'm not talking about capital gain. I've just taken the reference of capital gain. So please don't apply that logic it would be short term, it will be long term. No, you have to just do a index, right? So let's say on the second year, the CI for this year is, uh, I'm just giving you a random value. Let's say it is 360. So tell me how much is the indexed value of this 85,000. Sir, we know that simply we will um, apply that formula itself. Indexed value of RFA will be CI for this year. Second year is 360 divided by CI of the first year, it was 348 into this index value, 
this value which we have to index 85,000. How much it will be? 360 divided by 348 into 85,000. So this will be 87,931.0. So I'm taking it 931. So what is 87,931 sir? This is the indexed value of this 85,000 after second in second year, whatever the value was in first year 85,000 in second year, it will be 87,931. Similarly, if I ask you, let's say if I ask you, what would be the index value in the sixth year, let's say, and if I give you that sixth year CIA is, I'm taking it very randomly, random number. Let's say the sixth year CIA is 425. So how you will calculate it's the same way in the sixth year, the indexed value would be 425 CI of this sixth year divided by CI of the first year because we are indexing this 85,000 and the first year index value was 348. Getting it? Nothing new. Divided by 348 into 85,000. How much it will be? 425 divided by 348 into 85,000. So this would be rupees 1,3807.4. So let me take it 807. So tell me what is this 1,3807? So this is the indexed value of 85,000 in sixth year. In sixth year, this value would be 1,3807. This same concept has been introduced, has been inserted in rent-free accommodation value also. Now they are saying, that the value of accommodation cannot be more than, cannot be more than the indexed value, cannot be more than the index value. When, let's say if the employee is continuing that particular house, which has been provided by employer, let me repeat myself. Or, okay, let me give you an example. Let's say you take example of yourself. Let's say you, uh, are now you got a job with a company as a finance manager. Let's say, for example, in Nestle Limited. In Nestle Limited, you got a job as a finance manager. And they are saying, your employer is saying that so and so much is your compensation pack package. And we will give you a accommodation also. We will give you a two room accommodation also, two room flat also we will give you. So this is the accommodation which we give to our manager. Okay. So they have given you accommodation also, right? This is a perquisite rent-free accommodation they have given you in the first year. And in the second year also, you have already completed your first year in that organization. Now it is, and you are enjoying working over there. You are getting good salary. You are getting good perquisite. So you are enjoying also. You are enjoying your job also. In the second year, will you leave? No, sir. If I am enjoying, if I am getting everything, why should I leave? Okay. In the second year, you also you will continue in that company. Will that house will also be provided to you? Yes, sir. The same house will be provided the same house. I'm using that term same. The same house will be provided to, to this to you in the second year also. Why the company will change your house? In the third year also, if you have continued, you are working with the company, you are really enjoying your company. You got a promotion also. So now you are enjoying it more. So the same house will be continued. So generally, we understand that if the employer provides us with an accommodation, and if we are working with that company for more than one year or two years, three years, the same house would be provided to us. Yes, unless and until we got some extra promotion, we become a vice president of that company. Now they will, they might give you some un, another big house as accommodation, right? But generally speaking, when whenever you get an accommodation, it, it continues for another two, three, four years, right? So now they have inserted this particular point in that scenario. They are saying, if an employee gets an accommodation and if that same accommodation is continued for subsequent years also, in second year also, in third year also, in fourth year also, then in that, that case, I'm again repeating it, I'm emphasizing on this point because this is something which is very important amendment and which can come in your examination, especially this theoretical part. Why I'm saying this theoretical part? Because practical part is not uh, actually um, can come. Why? Because this amendment has been introduced from this year itself. So anyways, from this year itself, this year CI would be 348 because right now I have taken a random value. But we have we don't know the CI for the next year. What would be the CI 
for previous year 2425 that has not yet been released by the government right so we don't know the cif we know the cif of the previous years or the previous by previous year i'm here mean the last years we know the cif which has already been occurred which which have passed now but we don't know the cif of future so that is the reason i'm saying that this question practical question will not come in 2024 examination because this concept has been introduced from this year itself where ci is 348 this can come in examination the students who will appear in 2025 2026 or onwards it can come in their examination but in your examination 2024 only theoretical question can come practical question i don't think it can come because it is not very much uh, because it is not practical to know the ci of the future years right okay so the now the situation the amendment is finally if you are getting in a house if you got a house which you have continued for subsequent year also then the value of your perquisite in those subsequent year in second year third year fourth year cannot be more than the indexed value cannot be more than the index value so here when i was explaining to you that the value of accommodation is 5% of rfa 7.5% of rfa 10% of the rfa as the case may be depends on population or even if the accommodation is hired by the employer if you take actual hire charges or 10% of rfa here you have to use one more limit it should not be more than the indexed value it should not be more than the indexed value of the perquisite which has already been provided in earlier years and if the same houses continued to you if the same houses continued to you so let's say why and now the question arises why this concept why this inflation index why the ci concept has been introduced in this salary so please understand the logic over here let me explain that logic also to you let's say there is an assc there is an employee mr amit he joins a company let's say in first year he joins a company his salary is rupees 10 lakh for the year let's say his salary is 10 lakh for the year and first year he joins this company and he is provided with rfa also this rent free accommodation he has been provided which is hired by the employer at rupees let's say 2 lakh 30000 rupees this is the hire charges first of all tell me how much would be the perquisite value but how much would be the value of rfa for this year tell me how much is the value of rfa for this year so we understand this person is let's say working with i told you which company let's say he is working with maruti limited so uh, he is a non government employee should we take license fees no sir he is a non government employee he is working with maruti okay whether the accommodation is owned by the employer or hired by the employer you will say it is hired by the employer so in that case we take actual hire charges value of rfa is actual hire charges or 10% 15% 10% 10% now it has been changed 10% of rfa salary and in salary we take i also discuss with you we take basic salary da forming part plus all taxable portion of allowances plus commission plus bonus we don't take perquisites over here but yes we take other things all uh, these monetary values so 10% of rfa salary whichever is lower we take this right let's say let's say the rfa salary is this one 10 lakh i am taking it keeping it simple and short i am ke uh, keeping it 10 lakh is the rfa salary let's say okay this is entire 10 lakh is a basic salary let's say okay so how much is the uh, value of perquisite actual hire charges is 2 lakh 30000 which is mentioned in the question this is the actual hire charges or 10% of salary so 10% of salary would be 10 lakh into 10% that would be simple 1 lakh rupees this would be 1 lakh whichever is lower so the value of rfa will be 1 lakh rupees this is the value of r got it 1 lakh rupees would be the R rfa in the first year let's say in the second year amit performs really well in the first year of his employment he performs really well and he gets a high in his salary let's say his employer is very happy with his performance and they uh, increase their salary in the second year okay and in the second year 
his salary is increased to let's say he gets a very nice jump and his salary is increased to 16 lakh earlier it was 10 lakh and his now salary is increased to 16 lakh but the accommodation the same accommodation he is continuing the same accommodation he is continuing he is provided with the accommodation also in the same accommodation which we have given earlier in the first year the same accommodation has been provided to this person also in the second year also so the accommodation has not changed okay tell me what is the value of rf tell me what is the value of rf and let me take it very practically because what the landlord will do whosoever because this house is hired by maruti so someone must be the landlord so landlord has increased the rent so we generally understand that in india generally these landlords increase the rent every year by let's say 10 percent they have increased the rent also so this two lakh thirty thousand whatever the higher charges for the last year it has been increased now practically i have taken it very practically so they are increased by 10 percent that is twenty three thousand there is an increase so this has become two lakh fifty three thousand now okay so rental charges is now in the second year rental charges which is paid by the employer it is two lakh fifty three thousand also because we generally understand these landlord increase the rent every year okay value of rfa how much would be the value of rfa you will apply the same formula we understand actual higher charges actual higher charges or 10 percent of rfa salary right we understand this this is the he's a non-government employee hired by the employer so actual higher charges 10 percent of rfa salary actual higher charges is 253000 tell me how much is the 10 percent of rfa sir let's say the salary is 16 lakh let it assume that this is rfa salary 16 lakh into 10 percent this is 1 lakh 60 thousand rupees so 1 lakh 60 thousand whichever is lower we understand the value of rfa will become 1 lakh 60 thousand rupees 1 lakh 60 thousand would be the value of rfa tell me in earlier year the value of rfa was 1 lakh and the second year the value of rfa is 1 lakh 60 thousand rupees see it has increased by 60 percent now employee will say we can also say sir your salary is also increased that is the reason this value of rfa is increased okay we got it that salary is increased that is the reason value of rfa is increased but this employee will say he will say it very much technically he will say sir have you given me some another house or i have been given the same house you are you are continuing with the same house so uh, you uh, that person will say oh i understand but my salary is increased but my that house is not changed. I am continuing with the same house. So, how come the value of that house from 1 lakh it can go to 1 lakh 60,000? So, this is the formula it will go. But practically, this is something which is not correct. Understand? That is the reason they have come up with a very beautiful amendment over here. They will say, now if the assessee, if the employee is continuing with the same house in subsequent year also, then how we will cal calculate this value of RFA? We will calculate, we will see actual higher charges or 10% of RFA or uh, of RFA salary, whichever is lower. No, we have added one more condition over here. What condition we are adding? First was actual higher charges, second was 10% of RFA salary and the third condition they have added, indexed value of RFA. Indexed value of RFA whichever is lower now we will see index value of rfa also very beautiful amendment they have made right and practically which is very much relatable also okay so how you calculate index value of rfa you know this you understand that let me give you the cii for the second year a very random cii i am giving it to you let's say the cii for the second year is 380 and how much is the value for first year let's say in this year because this amendment has come from this year itself so i cannot go back so i can take it from this year itself let's say this year cio was 348 okay so first year cio was 348 second year cio was 380 and first year value was 1 lakh so you have to index this value how you will index you know that i've already discussed with you how you will index cio of this year cio of this year is 380 divided by cio of the first year First year by first year, I mean the first year in which this RFA is provided. And you cannot go back beyond 
23, 24, you cannot go back because it was this amendment is not a retrospective change. No, this is not a retrospective change. It has come from this year. So you cannot go back in previous year 22 or in previous year 21, 22 and all. No, it should not be before 23, 24. So CI of the first year, that is the reason I was saying that practical question, I doubt that in 2024 can come, but theoretically they can ask you an MCQ. But in 2025, the students who will be giving examination in 2025 and onwards, the practical question can also come in your examination. Okay, CI of this year, second year is 380 divided by CI of the first year, that was 348 into value of the first year, value was 1 lakh. So you have to index this value. Got it? Very important amendment. 380 divided by 348 into 1 lakh. Are you understanding the logic also why they have come up with this amendment? So this is 1 lakh 9,195. So tell me whatever is the lower least amount. So actual higher charge is 2 lakh 53. 10% of RFA salary is 160. And index value of RFA would be 1 lakh 9,195 whichever is lower now the third limit has also been inserted over here whichever is lower so we understand the least value is one lakh nine thousand one ninety five whichever is lower right if you would like to write it down you can write it down also okay you can write it down over here you can pause the video here and you can write it down got it so now you understand that this amendment is introduced because this is a very practical approach they have taken now right okay got it should i change this now okay come back so see the important amendment here is if the same accommodation is continued for more than one year if the same accommodation is continued for more than one year then the value of perquisite is restricted to CI. And what is the maximum RFA? CI of the previous year, CI of the previous year in which you are calculating. Let's say in the second year you are calculating the CI of that year divided by CI of the first year, first previous year. Which first previous year? When this accommodation was provided to you. And it should not be later than 23-24. Why? Because that amendment came into effect from this year itself. And into RFA perquisite value of RFA perquisite of the first year. Okay, easy and you understand this is RFA salary, this is same as before, no amendment over here. RFA salary is basic salary, whatever, what are the components which you use in your RFA salary, basic salary plus DA, if form parts of retirement benefit only, if it is mentioned in the question, then only takes that DA which forms part of retirement benefit. And if the question is silent about how much DA forms part of retirement benefit, you have to ignore that DA, please don't take that DA if it is not mentioned in the question. If something is mentioned 10% of DA forms part, 50% of DA forms part, one third of DA forms part, please only then take that component. If it is not mentioned in the question that DA does not form part, then please don't take it. Okay. Basic salary plus DA forming part plus all taxable allowances plus bonus plus fees commission. Commission, all types of commission. Only that commission which is Fixed percentage on turnover? No. Any type of commission can come over here. But perquisites are not here. Perquisites and retirement benefit you should not take. Right? So basic, I am again repeating what is covered in RFA salary, basic salary, DA forming part, all taxable allowances. And this is something which you don't have to learn in fact. You just read twice or thrice. You can make this RFA salary amount. You can calculate this RFA salary amount by looking at your question. Because I every time I say this, in fact, in my first revision class also, I have said this, that whatever you are getting from your employer, first of all, before calculating anything, first of all, you should make a list of it one by one. If you are getting basic salary, if you're getting DA, if you're getting uh, any other allowances, if you are getting any perquisites, just make, or if you're getting any retirement benefit like gratuity, pension, leave salary, anything, please make a list of it first. First of all, the first uh, step should be while cal while uh, cal um, this solving your salary question the first step should be please make a list of all the components which you are getting and the second step then should be the second step then should be to uh, write how much would be the taxable amount right in this just uh, in front of that 
So first you have to make a list of it, basic salary, DA, any allowances, any perquisite, just make a list of it. And after that, you should determine how much is taxable. So I was saying that once you have made that list, you will be easily be able to ascertain whether I should take that particular amount in my uh, calculating while RFA salary or not. So once you have made that list, so you will be able to determine if there is basic salary mentioned over there, you should take this. If DA is mentioned over there, but please remember only DA which forms part of retirement benefit only take that. If any taxable allowance is there, you should take that. If bonus commission is there, you should take that. So that is the re uh, that is how you will be able to remember this particular uh, definition that what is salary, what is the meaning of salary over here. Okay. And any other cash payment like regular pension, leave salary or expiration should be included over here. A leave salary, this leave salary is not a retirement benefit salary. No, this leave salary is which something which you in cash every year. So this is the regular amount. If leave salaries you have received at the end at the time of retirement, then you should not take it. Only leave salary or any gratuity which you receive regularly every year, you should take that. And even we understand while taking this RFA salary, if we are working with some other employer also simultaneously, we have to take these components of both those employer or more than uh, one employer also, right? And second important thing where students generally make mistake is, see, whenever you are calculating any perquisite, whenever, whenever you are calculating any perquisite and you have to take the meaning of salary. So only take those things which are provided during that period when you are using that perquisite. I'm again uh, repeating that. Let's say if rent free accommodation is provided to you for 12 months, then take all these components of those 12 months because it might happen that you have received any advanced salary, which is related to any future months. You have received the advanced salary. Or you might have received any areas of salary which relates to any past period. So while taking this RFA salary, please don't take that advance or area into consideration. For whatever period that perquisite is provided to you, you have to take that these components related to that period only. So let's say I'm again repeating here. I'm going slow here. here. If Let's say perquisite is rent free accommodation is provided to you from November till March. That is for five months. So can you take these value of five months, any five months? No, it should be particularly related to November to March itself, right? If the perquisite is provided to for this period, you have to take all these components related to that period only. I think I'm very much loud and clear here. Correct. Okay. Are you all enjoying it? Okay. Although it is revision, but here sometimes I think that uh, students can make mistake or they need some more clarity. So here, in that case, I explain that in detail. Okay. So salary only for the period for which accommodation is provided shall be taken into consideration. And if the employee is simultaneously working with more than employer, I have already discussed this. You have to take that uh, component also. And this is important. Accommodation is provided at two places. Let's say if uh, employee got an, uh, was uh, working in, let's say, Bangalore. He was working in Bengaluru and uh, he has been provided with an accommodation. But later on, he is uh, transferred to, let's say, Trivendra or Thiruvanthampuram. He is transferred to uh, some other city. But he says, sir, he requests the employer that please um, allow me to use that accommodation also because my, uh, my children are studying there. They have to go to school. So please uh, keep that accommodation also. And right now I'm moving later on, my family will also move, but please allow me to use that accommodation also. So if that accommodation is provided to you for first 90 days, only one of the accommodation will be taxable. Only one of the tech in, uh, accommodation will be taxable, which has lower value, which has lower value, only that would be taxable. And after 90 days, if the accommodation, the, both the accommodation is provided to you beyond 90 days period also. After that, then both the accommodation will be taxable. That is, you understand. Okay. Accommodation which is provided at a remote area. If accommodation is provided in a remote area, that is an exempt set. So if accommodation is provided at a mining site, onshore site or exploration, dam site, power generation site, then that set is exempt. Okay. 
one more amendment has uh, come over here in statutory update it is there see there are sometimes government employees any person uh, on deputation that person is not a government employee is not a central government or state government employee but they recruit them on deputation because for any of the body which is controlled by government let's say sebi or any of the body which is controlled by government they employ someone on deputation on temporary basis they employ someone let's say for one year or two year on contractual basis they employ someone on deputation so is that person a government employee we will say no that person is not actually a government employee but he is recruited on deputation purpose right on temporary basis he, he has been recruited by government so that that person will not become a government employee but let's say we are giving them him perquisite also let's say we are giving him rent free accommodation also so if we have given the rent free accommodation to that person who has been employed on deputation for any body or any institution which is controlled by government so how we will calculate the value of perquisite should we take it license fees the answer is no because he is not a government employee so we cannot take license fees in that case now there is a clarification which has come in that case we will assume that he is a non government employee as if the accommodation which has been provided by government by central or state government if we will assume that as if it is owned by the employer right so in that case please take it this way for people who are employed by government on deputation purpose on deputation basis then please consider them other employee and consider their rfa as if it is owned by the employer not hired but owned by the employer so this is another clarification which has come in statutory update if accommodation is provided by central government or state government employee so to an employee who is serving on deputation that person is actually not a state government employee or central government employee but he is serving on deputation where he was serving with any body or undertaking which is controlled by government he is serving in any body which is controlled by government so in that case if central government or state government has provided him an accommodation then calculate rfa as if accommodation is owned by the employee right got it and we understand that if a rent free accommodation is provided to judges of supreme court high court etc then it could be exempt if assessee is following default tax regime it would be taxable in optional tax regime it is exempt it is exempt only in optional tax regime if the assessee is following default then it would be taxable right concessional accommodation is very easy to uh, calculate so first of all you have to calculate the accommodation as if it is rfa as if the same way which we have uh, already discussed here and after that whatever the amount is recovered from the employee just deduct that you will get concessional accommodation okay so this was about rfa and there were some changes which has been happened in this for 2024 examination i have already discussed with you okay let's continue with other perquisites also give me a minute guys next is a specified employee first of all we should understand that why we are doing this specified employee what is the concept of specified employee because there are five kinds of perquisites guys yes, there are five kinds of perquisites which are always taxable which are taxable only for specified employee and if the employee is not a specified employee in that case those perquisites would not be taxable they will remain exempt so th these five kinds of perquisites are given under section 1723 although you don't have to remember this numbers but still you should know that there are five perquisites which are given under this section 1723 five are first is motor car facility second is your education facility third is uh, domestic servant domestic servant could be your watchman gardener sweeper cook cook etc facility fourth is utility bills that is uh, electricity bill gas bills etc these are utility bills and the fourth is for the people who are working in the employees who are working with transportation industry and if we give them free tickets for them or for their family members that is the fifth perquisite so we will see that there are five perquisites if you will see on the next page so perquisites these are taxable only in the case of specified employee so that is the reason we are saying that who is an specified employee so first of all these five perquisites are there i have already discussed motor car facility second is servant facility gardener watchman sweeper etc gas electricity or water charges that is called utility bills education facilities or free or concessional tickets for transportation employees so these five are 
only and only taxable for specified employee. So first of all, understand that who is a specified employee. See, there are three conditions. Three conditions are there. And if the employee satisfies any of these conditions, any of these conditions get satisfied, then the employee becomes specified employee. First condition is, if the employee is also a director of our company, if we are a company, if the employer is a company and that employee is a director of the company, what kind of director? Any type of director, whole time, part time, executive, non-executive, any type of director could be. And even it is not necessary that that person should be a director for the entire year. Even in case he is or he or she is a director for any one day in the previous year, that person will become a specified employee. So if this condition is satisfied, we will say specified employee. No need to check other conditions because any one is required. Second thing is that if that person is not a director, but that person has a substantial interest in our concern. Substantial interest means that person owns 20% or more profit share in our business, in our concern or in our company. That person holds 20% or more equity shares, which has voting rights, the profit sharing. So in that, in that case, that would be uh, that person will become a specified employee. And the third one is if the third one is quite common because these two th these two conditions are quite rare and it is quite difficult. Practically, these are quite difficult because any employee could also be a director. It can be, but in a very rare situation, someone holding 20% or more substantial right in our company, any employee holds 20% or more rights in our company. That is also quite rare practically, but yes, for theoretical purpose, we learn these things. But the third one is quite common. And even I can say even that almost 100% of the employees satisfies these, this condition. If they have monetary income, if they have, I'm using the term monetary income, if that employee has a monetary income of more than 50,000 rupees under the head salary, should we take GTI? No, under the head salary, if the salary income Head salary, I means salary as computed gross salary, less deductions. That is the net salary. That is salary income. If that person has a salary income, which income monetary income is more than 50,000 in the previous year, that person will become a specified employee. And I tell you almost every employee, almost every employee, I can say 99.99% employee satisfies this condition that their monetary income is more than 50,000. 50,000, you understand if I'll divide it by 12. So per month, it would be 4,600 something, right, which everybody earns. So that is the reason I'm saying that almost every employee satisfies this condition. So we can say that almost every employee is a specified employee. But yes, theoretically, we should understand that these are the three conditions. If employee satisfied any of those, he become or she become specified employee. Second important thing is what is this monetary income? Here you will take all the monetary income which he is getting. That is basic salary you have to take dns allowance forming part no if entire da entire da you have to edit all the monetary all the cash component which is his particular person is getting bonus commission commission could be of any type any fees or even uh, that person is getting any perquisite also you can add that but only that perquisite that is monetary you don't have to consider non monetary perquisite in this definition because we are concerned about only monetary income. So monetary perquisites are also included. And I've already discussed with you uh, when I have started this lecture, what are monetary and what are non monetary perquisites. Generally monetary perquisites are those for which you get reimbursement from your employer. So any payment which you get during the year, like gratuity you receive or any pension which you receive or any leave salary which you receive, not at the time of retirement, during the term of your service which you receive it. And also here while calculating the monetary income, if you have received something in advance or in area, that will also be considered over here. And even second important thing is that if the employee is working with more than one employer also, then we take the salary of that particular employer as well. Because here we need monetary income under the head salary. So here we can easily say that under the head salary, if we are calculating his income under the head salary, so it could be from any of the employer, right? So if he is working with more than two employers or three employers, then we have to take the salary of all the employers group together. So more than one employer salary should be included. Any areas for advance should be included. And you have to calculate salary income that is after deduction of section 16. But here you understand that if the SSC is following default tax regime, that is new scheme. If the SSC is following 115 BAC, then we can give only one deduction that is standard deduction. But if SSC is following uh, optional scheme, then in that case, we can give all the three deductions if available.
right? So this is how you calculate monetary income. So to sum up, who is a specified employee? Any director at any time during the previous year? It is necessary that entire year he should be a director? No, at any time during that year, even for a one day, if he is a director, okay. Second is if he holds twenty percent or more profit sharing in our concern, then he becomes a specified employee. Or third is which is very common if the monetary income under the head salary is more than fifty thousand rupees in the previous year. Okay, so why we have learned this specified employee concept because of these five perquisites. Because these five perquisites are taxable only for specified employee, and in case these perquisites are provided to a non-specified employee, in that case, please don't make it taxable. It will remain tax-free in that case. Okay. Again, one of the very important perquisites is motor car facility. So how you will compute a motor car facility? So do you know that for motor car facility, first of all, we have to determine whether this car is provided by our employer or this car is owned by us, that is employee. So first of all, so if a motor car facility is provided to you, first of all, we have to see the case one would be, case one is, whether this car is owned by employer or we, I can rather say this car is provided by employer. So this car is not owned by employee, it is provided by employer. Employer has provided this car to us. How he has provided it might be that employer might own that car or he might get this car hired from somewhere else and that car is given to you. So first of all, we have to see which case we are doing. So if the car is provided by employer, it comes under first case. Second case could be if this car is owned by employee. So there can be perquisite here as well. If the, this car is owned by employee, some students might wonder that if the car is owned by employee, then how can it become perquisite? It can become perquisite, right? How? Because car is owned by employee but its petrol expenses, its diesel expenses, fuel, running and maintenance expenses can be borne by the employer. So in that case, it becomes perquisite, right? So first, this is case number two. This is case two. So let me discuss this case first. If the car is provided by employer, let it be owned by the employer or hired by the employer as the case may be. But this is not the car of the employee. It has been provided to him. So first of all, we have to see if the car is provided by employer, then whether how this car is getting used, how we are using this car, is it used for 100% official purpose or it is used for 100% personal purpose or it is used for official or personal purpose, both the purposes. So this is how we have to determine first. So if the car is provided by employer, case one, then again, it has three sub cases. One is hundred percent official purpose. Tell me, you can you have to, you don't have to learn this. Just apply your brains. Let's say if the car is provided by employer, but that car should only be used. That car employee can only use for official purpose. He cannot use for his own benefit. So he is not deriving anything out of it. So why he will pay tax, right? Because every, the car which is provided to him, let it say it is a very luxury car also. Let's say it is BMW or Mercedes Benz, and like the car like that. But that car is used only for official purpose. So this is not in my benefit. This is not, not the benefit because you cannot use it for personal purpose. So if it is official purpose, we understand the perquisite value will be nil. In that case, the perquisite value will be nil. But if it is for 100% personal purpose, this is the benefit which I'm getting. So if the car is provided by the employer, I can use it or my family member or my household members can use this car for personal benefit. And this car is provided by the employer, right? And he is might be, he might be also incurring some running and maintenance expenses for this, or he might give a chauffeur also a driver also to you. So in that case, that becomes a purpose. And the entire value, all the expenses, all expenses which are borne by employer becomes perquisite. All the expenses which are borne by the employer becomes perquisite. And let's say if the employer is recovering any amount from you, then you can deduct that amount. 
any amount recovered from the employee, you can deduct that. amount. So what kind of expenses employer can bear? Let's say if the car is hired, in that case, the higher charges employer can bear. If the employer is also paying for running and maintenance expenses, your patrol, diesel expenses, fuel expenses, that expenses employer can occur. If the driver is also provided, then the driver's salary will also be these all the expenses which employer can occur. Let's say if, uh, sir, if the car is owned by the employer, then he might not be paying any higher charges. So in that case, you will take normal wear and tear of the car. And how much we take? 10%. 10% of the cost of the car. Here a cost of the car means actual cost, the original cost, not the written down value. You have to take the actual cost, right? 10% per annum, 10% per annum. So let's say if the question says that the car is provided for you for four months. So in that case, 10% into you can do this four by 12, right? So all the expenses which are incurred by the employer and any amount recovered from the employee would be subtracted. So this is a thumb rule. Whenever any amount is recovered from the employee, it should be subtracted from the set. The only exception here is when we will see about when the car is used for both the purposes where we take a fixed limit of 1800, 2400, which I'll be discussing right now. In that case, we don't deduct any recovery. But otherwise, in all the sets, generally, this is a thumb rule. Whatever amount we recover from the employee, we deduct from the first we calculate the set value. Then whatever is the set value, we deduct amount, whatever is recovered from the employee. This is a thumb rule. But yes, it has certain exceptions also. Okay. So if you see in your book, so if the car is provided by employer, owned or hired by the employer, 100% for official purpose, not a perquisite, 100% for personal purpose, everything will become perquisite, everything, all the expenses which the employer is incurring, any amount recovered should be subtracted. But what if, if the car is partly for personal and partly for official purpose, that is the car is used for both the purposes. In that case, first we have to see whether this is the car is used by both the uh, purposes, whether the expenses are borne by employer or the expenses are borne by employee. First of all, you have to see well, who is incurring those expenses because car belongs to employer or he has arranged the car for you. But who is bearing those running and expenses cost? So is it employer or employee? First, we, the question will tell us that employer is incurring. Okay. Then we will ask whether it is a small car or it is a big car. So what is a small car? Any car which has a engine capacity up to 1.6 liter cubic capacity, CC, 1.6 up to 1.6 liter, we say that it is a small car. And if it is more than 1.6 liter CC, we say it's a big car. So if the expenses are borne by employer and it is a small car, then you take 1800 per month as a perquisite and this is a fixed amount this is a fixed amount if it is a big car you will take 2400 per month as a perquisite it is a fixed amount right if anything is recovered over here please don't subtract it this is one of the exception generally i have just mentioned that generally if, if anything you recover from the employee that becomes that could that should be reduced from the value of perquisite but here, this is one of the exception over here. If anything is recovered, please don't deduct it from here. This is a fixed value, 1800 per month or 2400 per month. On the other hand, if these expenses are borne by employee, then it would be for small car, it is 600 per month. For big car, it is 900 per month, right? So it is mentioned also in your book, partly uh, personal, partly official. Expenses met by employer, 1800, 2400 for big car, 1800 for small. Take 1.6 liter is your small car, up to 1.6. Expenses met by employee, then 600 and 900, right? And if the driver is also provided, please add 900 per month in any of the cases. Here, if driver is also provided, that is chauffeur is also provided, please add 900. In 2400, please add 900. 600, please add 900. 900 plus 900, that would become 1800. Here, if chauffeur is also provided to you, right? Second question arises, sir, if the car is provided for, let's say seven months, 20 days, then we have to don't, we have to ignore that uh, period of which is not in uh, the completed months because we have to take only completed months over here. So part of the month we will ignore, we will ignore that part of the month. So if it is seven months for how many days? Don't do, please don't take that uh, part of the month. Only you have to consider the entire months, right? Seven months. And how do we calculate months? 
I tell you generally in income tax, in income tax act, we calculate month on the basis of date wise. We calculate month on calendar month basis. That is, let's say if uh, the car is provided to an employee on 15th of April, let's say 15th of April 2023. So one month will be counted from 15th of April till 14th of May. This would be one complete month, right? In income tax, we generally uh, take these months on calendar year basis, date wise. So 15th from 15th April to 14th May is first, first month from 15th May and so on till 14th of June, it would be second month, right? So if any car is provided to you, let's say question will, uh, will tell you that the car is provided to you from 16th of May 2023 till let's say 30th December 2023. So how you will calculate? First month would be from 16th May till 15th of June. So till 15th of June, it is first month. 15th June, 15th July, then 15th August, 15th September, 15th October, 15th November, 15th December also. And after that, there are some days which are left. You have to ignore those days. So in that case, here it is just seven months, right? So you understand how you will be calculating those months also. Part of the month should be ignored. Okay, and I've already mentioned these 1800, 2400, uh, this everything is uh, a fixed amount. If anything is recovered, please don't deduct from the this percusant. Month shall be taken as calendar month. Exa example also I have mentioned, let's say it is from 28th January and this will end on 27th of February. Part of the month should be ignored. Small car is up to 1.6 liter CC. This is important. Let's say if the employee has provided with you more than one car, let's say they have provided you two cars and the employer says that both these cars you can use for personal as well as official purpose. Both the cars you can use it for personal and official purpose. In that case, what you have to do is you have to take only one car. Consider only one car as being used for both the purposes, right? I'm again saying if the employer says that you can use both the cars for both the purposes, right, uh, personal and official, you have to consider only one car as being used for both purpose and all other cars should be considered as 100% personal. All other cars should be uh, considered as 100% personal. So this was important. And again, fifth point is also important. If a facility is provided to the employee, that is only pick and drop facilities provided, only pick and drop facility. That uh, You understand that most of the companies, they provide a cab facility to the employee. Uh, they arrange a cab and in that cab, three or four employees sit together and they come to office. So that cab facility is only from um, bringing them from home to office. And then uh, then we uh, we also provide them a drop facility from office to the uh, through their respective places. So if the facility is provided only of pick and drop from their office to home, uh, to, from their, sorry, from their home to office and then from office to back to their home, then that perquisite is exempt. That is not a taxable perquisite. That will remain a exempt perquisite. Got it? So if cab facility is provided for pick and drop, uh, drop only, then please make it a tax-free perquisite. Don't tax that perquisite. Second case is if the car is owned by the employee. If the car is owned by the employee, then in that case, again, you will. this is the second case, right? Car, car is owned. You remember that? I was telling you. The first case is car is provided by employer, but the second case is car is owned by the employee. If the car is owned by the employee, then you will ask, please tell me whether it is used for 100% official purpose. So if it is for 100% official purpose, then you will not make any thing taxable. The value of perquisite will be nil. Because why? Because if the car, see, car belongs to us, let's say, if car belongs to us, then how it, it will become perquisite? Let's say might be employer might, might be giving you some expenses. He might be giving you some patrol expenses or any other expenses. He is reimbursing you. So in that case, it can become perquisite. But why employer is giving? Because this car is used only for 100% official purpose. In that case, the value of perquisite will be nil because you are not getting any benefit. You are not deriving any benefit out of it. So why you will pay tax, right? And if it is used for partly personal and partly official purpose and these expenses are borne by employer these expenses are borne by employer because here the expense if the expenses are borne by employee then the question will not arise of any perquisite why see the car is 
car also belongs to employee and if the employee is bearing those expenses also then he is not getting any benefit correct the benefit will only arise when these expenses are borne by employer so here the second case that expenses are borne by the employee that doesn't arise at the first place so uh, uh, perquisite can only come if the expenses are borne by employer right if the expenses are borne by employer so first of all you have to see whether it is a small car that same 1.6 liter cc whether it is a small car or it is a big car so all the expenses which are borne by employer all the expenses which are borne by employer that becomes perquisite value for you but in that case you have to deduct you have to deduct that 1800 per month out of it 1800 per month out of it that will become perquisite so if the car uh, if they are, they are giving your expenses for entire 12 months so how much you will be deducting 1800 into 12 right and if the driver is also provided you can again deduct 900 of this so all the expenses all the expenses which are borne by employer take that as a perquisite but after that deduct 1800 per month uh, per month if it is for 12 months 1812 if it is for 10 months 1800 into 10 and if it is for 11 months 4 days or 11 months 24 days so whatever part of the month should be ignored only complete month should be taken right uh, 1800 into 1100 it will become and also deduct 900 per month for the driver or I can also write it this is just a math mathematical equation I can because I am subtracting these both these amounts from this per set. I can also write in this way if I'll write bracket over here so I have to deduct everything so 1800 plus 900 you have to deduct it from here so that is simple mathematics equation right if I add a bracket over here if it is a big car you have to deduct 2400 per month and also if driver is also provided you have to deduct 900 per month or if i'll write a bracket over here then you have to deduct 2400 and 900 from it right see if it is a small car all the expenses which are incurred by the employer deduct 1800 and plus 900 why i have written plus over here because i have inserted a bracket over here so these both these amount are getting deducted from these expenses if i'll open this bracket it will become minus right Okay, so the question arises whether we can deduct uh, if employ employee um, claims that no sir, this is not the perquisite. Actually, I use this car most of the most of the uh, time. This I use this car for official purpose. I want more amount to be deducted. I want this eighteen hundred and nine hundred, which is getting deducted. It's very less amount because employer pays me expenses, but he also makes sure that most of the time I use this car only for official purpose. So my in 90% of the cases, my car is used for only 10% I use it for personal 90% it is used for official purpose. So he claims that higher amount should be deducted. Can it be possible? The answer is yes. If that employee maintains sufficient documents, specified documents, he maintains the logbook, he maintains the detail of the journey, my mileage of the car, and he also certifies this particular logbook from his employer, then a higher amount can also be deducted from this higher amount can also be deducted from this. So if specified documents can be maintained, then he can also deduct higher amount. Then we, we will not take 1800 or 2400. We can deduct that higher amount. So details of journey, mileage of the card, amount of expenditure, certificate by the employer. If he maintains, then we can also deduct the higher amount, right? See, okay. And if the expenses are met by the employee, it will not be a perquisite. I have already discussed because the car is also car also uh, belongs to employee. And if employee is only bearing the expenses, then there, there is no point of perquisite, right? Okay. Tell me, I have mentioned that these five kinds of perquisite out of that five, I have already discussed one motor car facility, uh, or I can say that these five perquisites are only taxable for specified employee. These five perquisites are mentioned under section 1723. Although you don't have to remember this, but I am just referring this section so that back of the mind, you might uh, remember this section also. Recall this section also in your examination. Okay. Uh, there are five perquisites. These are taxable only for specified employee. Only for a specified employee. We will see that there is one more section. I am referring that section number, but again, I am saying that you don't have to remember it. There is a section after the 1723, there is a section 1724. 1724. 1724 talks about obligation of the employee met by employer 17 to 4 it is not taxable only for a specified employee 17 these five 
perquisites which i uh, i had referred earlier also motor car education facility gardener sweeper watchman servant utility bills etc these are for specified employee only for 1723 is for specified employee all other perquisites are taxable for all types of employees rent free accommodation was for all types of employees all the perquisites which we will be discussing uh, uh, today also that will be for all the employees except these five perquisites so 1724 perquisite is taxable in the hands of all the employees so 1724 is obligation of the employee met by the employer 1724 doesn't mention any of the perquisite but they say that if there is any obligation any obligation of the employee which is met by employer what does this phrase means this phrase means that there is some personal obligation anything which is a personal obligation for me and if this my my this is my personal obligation that is my personal liability and if this personal liability my personal obligation is borne by someone else then i get get a benefit because this otherwise if he would not have borne this i would have spent the amount for uh, for that particular obligation right so if there is any particular uh, per my personal obligation which is borne by my employer it becomes a perquisite and for all types of employees whether they are specified or they are non specified it is taxable for everyone so tell me let's say if employee has a car i am giving an example of what is uh, the personal obligation of the employee let's say employee owns a car employee owns a car let's say employee father has gifted him a car okay and he owns this car okay and he uses it for 100% personal purpose also he uses this car for 100% personal purpose also so tell me there will be some expenses which will be incurred their fuel expenses running and maintenance expenses there would be running and maintenance expenses also so tell me it is whose obligation it is whose obligation to uh, spend on these petrol fuel expenses maintenance expenses it is whose obligation the sir the person who owns this car right whether this employee is working with some company or whether this per person even leaves the job or he doesn't join any jobs let's say he has any business so whether he is working with that company whether he is not working with, with that company if that person any person who owns a car that car is owned by himself that particular person and he used this car for 100% personal purpose also so it is their personal responsibility it is their personal responsibility whether they are working with that company or not working with that company it becomes their personal obligation so when it becomes their personal obligation this kind of perquisite if it is given by employer let's say car is owned by employee he is using it for 100% personal purpose but running and maintenance expenses although it was the personal obligation of the employee but this was met by employer in that case it becomes perquisite under 1724 right and it is taxable for everyone it is taxable for everyone in that case we will don't will not see whether a, that person is specified or that person is non specified because if any personal obligation of the employee is met by the employer it becomes taxable so why i am discussing this i am discussing it because if the car is owned by the employee and it is used for 100% personal purpose and this expenses this running expenses are borne by employer it becomes 17 to 4 it doesn't it will not remain in 17 to 3 it will go in 17 to 4 because this is personal obligation of the employee made by the employer do you remember that and it is taxable for everyone so here i have mentioned this also if the car is owned by the employee and used for 100% personal expenses by by employer then it becomes uh under 17 to 4 because this is an obligation of the employee which is met by the employer it is taxable for every type of employee okay and next um, although this is not very important but yet uh, examiner can ask you if employee has a two wheeler it's not car it's two wheeler he has a bike or a scooter or a scooty in that case if uh, this is for used for 100% official purpose that it will not be a perquisite but it is used for partly personal partly official but this two wheeler is owned by the employee is owned by the employee and the expenses are met by the employer then in case, that case you can deduct 900 rupees per month so here it is 900 rupees which you can deduct all the expenses which is incurred by the employer take that as a perquisite and you can deduct 900 rupees per month right 
Okay, let's come to the next perquisite, which is servant facility. So if the servant is provided by the employer, you got the servant because of your reason of employment. It was not your personal obligation. It was not your own servant, uh, which uh, whether you, because there might be a possibility that you have a servant earlier also. When you were not working with the company, you have, you have a servant. So if that servant was there also, and if employer reimburses the salary of that servant to you, so that was your personal obligation. That will become 17 to 4. That will be taxable in all hands. But I'm talking about the situation where you have joined a company, let's say you have joined Indian Oil Corporation and because of your employment, they have given you a servant, a watchman or a gardener or a cook or any other domestic servant they have given to you. So this is what we say that you got a servant by reason of employment. So in that case, it becomes 17 to 3. But if, if it was your personal obligation, let's say there was a Ramu Kaka in your place, See, that's the name of the servant. So, but he was your very old servant. He was your very old servant. So if that amount, his salary is reimbursed by your employer, in that case, that is 17 to 4. That was your personal obligation of the employee, right? Okay. This we are discuss in length in our regular classes. And I understand that you must be remembering that also. Okay. So uh, value of purchase, whatever the expenses which employer is incurring, whatever the expenses which employer is incurring, please take that, add that as a perquisite. Or, and the thumb rule is whatever the amount is recovered from you, you, you can deduct that. Okay. Gas, electricity and water facility. We understand that if uh, the expenses which is incurred by the employer, the expenses which em employer is bearing, that will become the perquisite and any expenses recovered from you, that will be deducted. So here we can see that if, uh, let's say the employer has provided with you a gas cylinder, right? Gas cylinder or any of the electricity bill, which they are, um, giving you as a reimbursement. So in that case, whatever the amount they are uh, expense, uh, the expenses which is incurred by the employer, because from where they are getting these gas cylinders and everything might be they are purchasing it from somewhere else. So if they are purchasing it from somewhere else, that the expenses which they are incurring is the purchase cost. But there might be a situation that this company is in, a man is in the manufacturing business of those gas cylinders. So in that case, their manufacturing cost would become their uh, that will become their cost. So that is the manufacturing cost of the employer will become the perquisite and any amount recovered, obviously that would be deducted, right? Okay. Next is education facility. Again, important. Please remember that one thumb rule is that, that if any education facility is provided to the employee, if the education facility is provided to the employee, that facility, that education could be a one day workshop. It could be a one week workshop. It could be a, let's say six months training, even a year or a two years training. Let's say company has sent um, um, the employee to get an MBA degree. So it could be a one day, it could be a 10 days, it could be one month, one year, two years and so on. Any education or any training which is provided to the employee, that is 100% tax free. That is 100% tax free. Because why? Because they, uh, they train their employees so that they can, that employee can work, then that employee can be more productive and in turn there, it will benefit their company. So if any uh, training or any education is provided to the employee, then it will become a tax free perquisite. But if this education is provided to any other family member, it will become taxable. If it is provided to any other family member, then it will become taxable. But here the point here is, if this education is provided to the children of the employee, the children of the employee and this, the education which is provided to the children, it is either in the employer's school or employer's institution or they have arranged for the admission. Let Because here I am mentioning that the children got admission over there because of the reason of your employment. In that case, for children, the this perquisite value can be exempt if it is not more than 1000 rupees, if it is more than 1000, that will become taxable. But if it is not more than 1000 rupees per month, then it will become exempt. And how for how many number of children Two? no, in children education allowance, it is just for two children. But here there is no limit on number of children. So if the education is facilities provided to children's in employers institution or other institution by reason of employment, by reason of employment only, then you can deduct one uh, if 
uh, then what you will do is if the value of perquisite is up to 1000 per month then it is exempt but if it is more than 1000 per month then it is fully taxable i am saying fully taxable if 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 it comes 1200 rupees per month then please make it fully taxable 1200 rupees per month so value of perquisite will become in the case of children cost of such education whatever the employer is incurring the cost of such education minus any amount recovered and if this amount after deducting this amount recovered if it is 1000 or less than 1000 per month then please make it exempt please make it exempt right but if it is more than 1000 per month please make it taxable right but if the education is facilities provided to the children there is a very very minor difference over here if the education facilities provided to the children but not because of the reason of employment right not because of the reason of employment it was a personal obligation of the employment by the employer it becomes fully taxable then you will not see that 1000 per month criteria then please ignore that 1000 per month criteria right this 1000 per month criteria this exemption will only be allowed when the children are studying because of the reason of employment right cost of such edu education how much is the cost of such education so whatever the employer is paying to that institution that will become cost let's say but if this institution is owned by the employer then what will be the cost then we will see the amount which similar institutes and similar localities charge from their students we take that amount, right but for other then children we understand it is fully taxable other family members fully taxable for employee exempt okay and whenever we use this word child in income tax please again there is a thumb rule always stepchild or, or adopted child will be included stepchild or adopted child will be included grandchildren will not be included right for others children education facility is fully taxable okay next said is free or concessional tickets for transport employees let's say if uh, an employee is working with some uh, company uh, which uh, is engaged in transportation they have their buses they have their buses and they uh, what they are they are into traveling business uh, so any person who would like to go on a trip they can uh, book the tickets of that bus and they will take you to the two places so in that case if the employee is working with the transportation industry so if he gets benefit out of it let's say he or his fam or that employee or his or their family members are allowed to travel in their buses then it will become perquisite under 1723 and whatever what is the perquisite value whatever the amount they charge from their normal customer in the normal course of business that will become perquisite any amount recovered deduct that right so value perquisite would be amount charged for such benefit in normal course of business minus any amount recovered but please remember this perquisite is exempt for railway employees and airline employees for railway if railway tickets are given to uh, the family members of that uh, uh, railway employee or airlines employees that will be exempt so these are the five perquisites which were taxable only in the case of uh, specified employees 1723 now all the perquisites which i am discussing and rfa also which is taxable for every employee and i have already mentioned with you that 1724 is the obligation of the employee met by the employer any personal obligation of the employee which is met by the employer always taxable okay very important life insurance if life insurance if the employer pays your life insurance premium then it becomes fully taxable please understand it is not health insurance health insurance is exempt health insurance is exempt health insurance can also be called as Medi claim insurance, we can call it as accidental insurance also or health insurance also. That is exempt. If it is provided to the employee or their family members, it is exempt. But if life insurance, I'm again and again repeat, repeating, life insurance premium is paid by the employer, please make it taxable. Health insurance or another name is Medi claim insurance, another name is accidental insurance, exempt. Okay. This perquisite is one of uh, uh, the examiner's favorite credit equity shares or ESOPs. If credit equity shares or ESOPs are provided to the employee, it becomes taxable. So, what are credit equity shares? These are normal equity shares which are provided to the employee either free of cost or at concessional value, right? And we understand the thumb rule any amount which is recovered from the employer that will be deducted, okay? So, what will be the perquisite value? The fair market value of that shares. Let's say you, you're working with Wipro Limited. And you get the share of Wipro. Let's say you receive 100 shares of Wipro as a sweat equity. So how much would be the perquisite? Please see the face value or the market value. Sir, market value. Because I have received the shares of Wipro. Let's say the market value of the Wipro share is 500 rupees per share. 
So I have received the benefit of 500 rupees on every share. Let's say there are 100 shares, so 500 into 100, that is 50,000 benefit I have received. Right? Correct? So you have to take the market value of the share minus if you have paid any amount, that would be deducted. If you have not paid any amount, that will not be deducted. Important thing is that on of which date market value we should consider. So whenever you exercise the option, yes, I would like to avail this option. So the date on which you exercise the option of that date, we take the market value, right? But we make it taxable only when they are allotted. See, I have used two words over here. One is the date on which the option is exercised. Second is the date on which the shares are allotted. When shares are allotted in that year, it will be taxable. When you have exercised the option, we will take the market value. To make it taxable, we will take the market value of that date on which you have exercised the option. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have exercised the option on 30th March 2023 that I would be uh, taking these shares. So you have told your employer that I'll be exercising this option. So this date we will take fair market value of this date. But let's say employer takes around 15 days to get the shares allotted to you. So your sh you get the shares, actually the shares were allotted to you, let's say on 15th of April, 2023. So on this date, this will be taxable. So in this date, this will be taxable. So this is previous year, 23, 24, it will be taxable in 23, 24. Although you have exercised the option on 30th March, 23, that means Previous year 22, 23, you have exercised the, exercised the option, but you, the shares are allotted to you on 23, 24, right? In this previous year. So it will be taxable in the year when the shares were allotted to you. How much it will be taxable? We will take the market value. Market value of which date? The date on which the option was exercised, right? The second point is that how we will take that market value. See, if the shares are listed, you can take the market value from the stock exchange. And if the shares are unlisted, then it will be provided to you in the question because in that case we cannot take the value of the stock exchange then the merchant banker suggests the value so if the shares are listed then we can take the stock exchange value but if the shares are unlisted then as determined by merchant banker so here you don't have to worry about it question will give you the value which the merchant banker has to correct okay here let me explain this also if the shares are listed then you can take the value of the stock exchange sir if the stock exchange, if let's say our shares were listed in BSC, Bombay Stock Exchange, then take the value of Bombay Stock Exchange. But if the shares are listed on multiple stock exchanges, on BSC also, Bombay Stock Exchange also, or any other stock exchange like National Stock Exchange also, if they are listed on more than one stock exchanges, then we take that stock, we will select that stock exchange on which date, on that date where the maximum numbers of shares were traded that is the maximum volume was tra traded so let's say on that particular date on bsc there was certain number of volume of shares which were traded on that date and on nsc the number of shares which were traded were were more in that case we will take this particular stock exchange national stock exchange so if it is one stock exchange there is no problem but if it is multiple stock exchange please select that stock exchange where the volume of trade is more was more right Okay. Okay, sir, we, we know that on that date, we will take that particular stock exchange. So, but, but on that date, there were uh, different prices because uh, every minute the price of the share is fluctuating. So how we will take that? You have to take the average of the opening price and the closing price. So generally market opens at 9.15, right? Generally market opens at 9.15 and closes at 3.30. So what was the opening value at 9.15? What is the closing value? This can, you can easily, uh, easily get on Google, uh, Google. Okay. So you have to take the average of opening and the closing value, right? Take the opening average of opening value and the closing value you have to take. Otherwise, generally question simply question will give you that this is the price of, of this on the stock exchange. But if the, um, if the level of uh, question papers is a bit harder, then you can, uh, you, the examiner can ask you these things. So you have to take the average of the opening and closing price. But here also they can give you two prices, opening prices, they can give you two prices, buy price and sell price and closing price also, they can give you two prices, buy, sell, buy price and sell price, only take the sell price, only take the selling price. So opening selling price and closing selling. If only one uh, price is mentioned, one is one for opening, one for closing, then there is no problem. You can take the average. But if the two prices are mentioned, 
opening also buying and selling closing also buying and selling only take the selling price don't take the buy price right okay let's say it might happen that on particular date let's say on 30th of march 2023 you have exercised the option so you have to take the market value of this date but let's say if the market was closed on this date so so whatever is the nearest date let's say you can go on to 29th or 28th whatever is the nearest date on which trading had happened you can take that value but in that case if you are taking of any other date any other nearest date if you are taking that value you don't have to do the average only in that case you have to take the closing value so if no trading on that exercise date then only the closing price of the nearest date then you don't have to do the average you take you should take only the closing price and which price buying price or selling price only sell sell price right so this was important okay okay spf sorry saf super innovation fund super innovation fund so there are different types of um, pen, uh, retirement funds which employer can open for you one uh, one is called provident fund right one is pension scheme so one, another kind of fund is super innovation fund saf so if if employer contributes to the super innovation fund because this is the income which you have not actually received during the year but it is deemed to be received right it is deemed to be received you remember the first lecture basic concept i have mentioned that there are certain income which are deemed to be received so this is the one income which is deemed to be received because they have invested the amount in your super innovation fund which you will get the benefit actually when you will retire from this company right so if they are contributing to your super innovation fund that is exempt up to 7.5 lakh but if they are contributing more than 7.5 lakh then that excess will become taxable so let's say if they have contributed 8 lakh then up to 7.5 exempt that excess amount 50000 will become taxable but this 7.5 lakh is a combined limit of super innovation fund also recognized provident fund also and nps also so i will be discussing this with provident fund part so right now i have just given you a glimpse that up to 7.5 lakh it is exempt more than 7.5 lakh that excess will become taxable but this shares that 7.5 lakh limit with recognized provident fund also and with the new pension scheme also that i'll be discussing it once i'll be going with that part retirement benefit part which i'll be discussing sorry which i'll be discussing with you in my next lecture okay next important perquisite is interest free or concessional loan so whenever we take loan from our employer whenever we take loan from an employer we have to repay it back so let, let's say i have taken i am an employee of a company i have taken a loan of 1 lakh rupees from my company i have to repay it back so if, if i am re repaying it back it will not become perquisite but while taking the loan if i am getting any advantage what advantage i am getting it that interest advantage because if i'll be taking it from any of the bank then they will be charging me interest right if i am taking it from my employer if employer is not charging any interest that is interest free that is a benefit for me or if employer is charging lesser rate let's say normal bank rate is 15% but my employer is just charging 5% from me so how much i am saving 10% so that interest amount which i am saving that is a benefit for me so interest free or concessional loan means whether my employer is not charging any interest or they have given me loan on a subsidized rate on a concessional rate so we have to compare it with the normal bank rate so if normal bank rate would be given in your question please take that rate otherwise if multiple banks are given let's say they will give you the normal bank rates of sbi or pnb or icici bank you have to take the bank rate only of sbi state bank of india right please don't take for any other if only bank rate is mentioned then you can assume that this is sbi if there are multiple banks which are mentioned please take only select only sbi rate right second thing is that uh because there are different sbi rates also for education loan there is a different rate for vehicle loan there is different for home loan it is different for personal loan it is different so you have to take the purpose for which you have taken a loan let's say i have to, i would like to get a car that the employee would like to purchase a car and he takes a loan from employer for a for purchasing car so you have to take the rate of sbi of vehicle loan please don't take it for education or personal reason a uh, purpose loan only take the loan for that purpose you have taken the loan from the employer the same rate which sbi charges from their customer right so if it is an education loan take the rate of education loan if it is a vehicle loan take the rate of the vehicle loan of sbi right second thing is that 
Sir, uh, okay, we understand that we have to take that particular purpose loan only. But sir, the rate also keeps on fluctuating during the year. So you have to take the rate as on the first day of the previous year when the loan was taken. When the loan was taken. Let's say loan was taken on uh, 10th of June 2023. So you have to take the rate of SBI which was on first day of the previous year when the loan was taken. So loan was taken in the previous year 23, 24, let's say. So you have to take the first day on the first April, what was the rate of uh, the SBI for that particular purpose, right? So value of perquisite is interest saved on such loan that is bank interest rate minus interest charged by employer, right? Let's say the bank interest rate of SBI is 12% and interest charged by the employer is 4%. So how much you are saving? 8%. So 8% will become your perquisite value. And whatever is the outstanding balance of the loan, please calculate that. So question might ask also that the outstanding, let's say you keep on repaying the loan also. Let's say if, or, or on every month you keep on repaying the loan also. So if you are not repaying the loan, then we will assume that the entire loan which you have taken is still outstanding. If the question will tell you that this much amount is paid, then only calculate this interest saved only on the outstanding value. Okay. Let's say you every month you are repaying back something. So your outstanding will remain, uh, will be changing every month. So in that case, whatever is your outstanding on the last day of the month, I'm repeating, whatever is your outstanding on the last day of the month, please take that particular outstanding and apply whatever the interest which you have saved to you for that month. For next month, it will be again changed. So in that case, if the outstanding balance is changing every now and then, so in that case, please do this calculation separately for that period till the this is getting changed, right? So bank interest rate of SBI as on the first day of the previous year should be taken for the similar purpose. And if the amount of borrowed is changed during the year, because why it is getting changed, you are repaying it frequently. So in that case, the perquisite value is calculated on the basis of balance as on the last day of each month, right? Remember that? Very important. Third point is very important. It says, I would suggest uh, you should be, uh, you have this book, right? You have this book. You can download this book from the website. And I would strongly suggest if you can get a printout of it, you can get a black and white printout. It will hardly cost you 100 or 200 rupees. So I would really suggest if you are uh, doing this revision with me. So I would highly suggest get a printout of this, right? It will not take more than 100 or 200 rupees. First. Okay. Perquisite value is exempt in the following two cases. If the loan is a petty loan, if it is not more than 20,000 rupees in aggregate, it doesn't mean that you have taken 15,000, 15,000 ru uh, rupees loan five times. No, your aggregate, if the aggregate amount of loan is not more than 20,000 rupees, then it is an exempt perquisite. Second, if you borrow more than 20,000, but the purpose of borrowing is for the medical treatment, for the prescribed disease, for prescribed diseases like cancer, tuberculosis, HIV, etc. If the amount is borrowed for the prescribed diseases, in that case also that amount could be exempt. That this facility, this perquisite will be exempt, right? But remember, if you have taken the loan for the medical treatment of the employee or for any of the employee's family member, then it is exempt. But if they recover any amount from the insurance company, so whenever they have recovered the amount from the insurance company, they have to repay back the loan of the employer. And if they're still not repaying it, in that case, it will become perquisite. So whatever the amount which you have recovered from the insurance company, and still if you are not repaying it, then it will become the perquisite, right? Okay. Next is holiday home. Holiday home means, this is not LTC. Holiday home means that you uh, are, uh, been given a package you are been given a package where you you with your family you can travel the uh, employer will give you um, the expenses for your travel also he will arrange for your uh, accommodation also he will arrange for your all food and everything has been taken care of the entire package that is called holiday home so if holiday home is provided to you in that case whatever the expenses which have been incurred by the employer that will become perquisite and obviously any amount recovered that will be deducted Meals and refreshment important. Refreshments, your tea, coffee, your biscuits, these are tax free. These are tax free. In both the tax regime, these are tax free. But if it is meals, let's say it is dinner or lunch is provided to you, then it is taxable. Then it is taxable. If you are following default tax regime, new tax regime, then it is taxable fully. Then it is fully taxable. 
right in default tax regime there is nothing like 50 rupees per meal no in default tax regime it will be fully taxable please remember that but if it is you are following optional tax regime then meal facility would be ex would be exempt up to rupees 50 per meal up to rupees 50 per meal, meal would be exempt and in excess of 50 it would be taxable so meals refreshments fully exempt in both the tax regimes meal taxable in excess of 50 rupees per meal but this 50 rupees is only in optional tax regime in default tax regime there is no such thing like 50 rupees it would be fully taxable gifts if you receive gifts from your employees the person who is receiving the gift is an employee and the person who is giving you the gift is the employer then only it will be salary income if you receive your gift from your clients customers and everything and any other person in the course of a business or profession it will become pgvp and if you receive gift from someone else then it becomes ifos income right gifts are taxable under three heads and this this depends that who is receiving the gift and from whom so if it is the employer and employee relationship then it will be taxable under the head salary if it is a cash gift cash gift is fully taxable cash gift is fully taxable right if it is even less than 5000 rupees it is fully taxable cash gift is nothing like bonus and we understand bonus is fully taxable if it is a gift in kind if it is a gift in kind and the aggregate gift during the year is up to rupees 5000 if it is up to rupees 5000 then it will be exempt if the aggregate of the gift aggregate means if you have received gifts twice or thrice then please do the aggregate of the uh, value of those gifts and if it is up to 5000 then you can exempt but if it is more than 5000 then it will be taxable and here there are two point of view and both the point of view are acceptable by the institute institute accept both the point of view first point of view is that let's say if you get a gift in kind of 6000 rupees it is more than 5000 so you make entire 6000 taxable this is first point of view if you are adopting this point of view it is correct right it is correct second point of view is that if you have gift received gift in kind of 6000 rupees gift in kind of 6000 rupees sec, second point uh, view point is that you can deduct 5000 you can deduct 5000 and you can make only 1000 taxable you can make only 1000 taxable this point of view is also acceptable by the institute so if it is more than 5000 rupees Either you can make it fully taxable or you can make it in excess of 5000 taxable. Whatever you are following it, you can follow. You can follow both the, um, these viewpoints are acceptable by the institute, right? Credit card facility. Credit card facility is that, that you are being provided with a credit card or you or your, any of your family member has been given a add-on card or any other credit card. So if it is used only for official purpose, then it is tax free. Of course, it is not taxable. But if it is used for personal purpose, so whatever the employer is incurring the expenses, let's say they are paying their annual fees or subscription fees, if they are paying, then that would be taxable, right? Club, gym and recreational facilities, if it is given to all the employees, uh, recreation, club facility or gym facilities to the employees only, all the employees uniformly it is provided, it is exempt. But it is if it is only given to the specific employee, or to the employee's family member, then it will be taxable. Then it will be taxable only for a specific employee or to their family members, it will be taxable. But yes, there is one point over here that the initial, some clubs take registration charges, initial registration charges, and then they then they take recurring fees like annual fees or monthly fees. So regist registration charges would be exempt, but that recurring charges would be taxable, right? But if it is for the just for the employees uniformly for all the employees then it will be exempt but it is for, if only for the specific employee or to their family members then it will be taxable but in that case only the initial fees can be exempt but otherwise the recurring fees would be taxable right next is use of employer movable asset i think uh, i'll stop here and i'll continue there are some more prerequisites are left i'll be continuing this in my next lecture right let me stop it over here uh Till then, I will um, suggest you and I'll especially recommend you, please start doing your past year questions and your MTPs and RTPs questions. That is very important. It is very important to practice. I Every time I say in every lecture that it is very important to practice yourself. If you are not doing many questions, at least two or three questions you should do by writing. By writing, that is very important. Okay, let's um, meet in our next lecture. Till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care.